Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the American Academy of Diplomacy's interview series. I am your host, Joshua Loisel, and I hope everyone is staying healthy and safe during these times. The purpose of this series is to share experiences of Academy members with students in the general public in hopes of supporting the Academy's mission of strengthening the appreciation and understanding of US diplomacy and foreign policy. We also hope to use this opportunity to inspire the next generation to explore opportunities in the field. Be sure to follow the American Academy of Diplomacy's YouTube channel and follow us on all of our social media pages. Without further ado, it is my privilege to introduce our next guest, Ambassador Peter Bodie. Ambassador Bodie has had a distinguished career at the State Department, serving as ambassador to Malawi, Nepal, and then to Libya. Prior to his ambassadorship, Ambassador Bodie worked as the Deputy Chief of Mission in Islamabad and has served as Counselor for Administrative Affairs in India, Denmark, as well as serving in South Africa. Ambassador Bodie, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. All right. So my first question, of course, for you is I was wondering if you could walk us through your personal experience during the 2015 earthquake in Nepal. Thank you. I, I'd have to. It, it's, I have to say we're coming up on almost six years past it. And it uh, happened all so quickly. It quickly becomes a blur. But looking back, some of it seems even clearer then. But what happened is on April 25th, 2015, which happened to be Anza Day, the uh, celebration of all the bravery for us, Australia and New Zealand soldiers in World War I. My wife and I were at an early morning event at the Australian embassy and had come back after being getting up very early. We were back at the residence in Kathmandu, our home. And at 10 to 12, I was actually had taking a nap and all of a sudden I felt this incredible shaking. I thought it was my wife waking me up. And I also heard our dog barking and he was grabbing me out the side of the bed. And my wife said, no, I'm not waking you up, it's the earthquake. And we had been thinking there might, we always lived with the possibility of an earthquake in Kathmandu, but even though we, we said that's our third tour in Nepal and our ninth year there, it was the first time we ever had one of the significance. And I looked up, if you can imagine, the ceiling was moving above my head about a foot and a half each way. And it was a old concrete building and had that fallen, I would have been seriously hurt. It didn't, thank God. The dog grabbed me and sort of rolled off the bed and we got out of the house only to realize that I had to quickly go back in to get my uh, walkie-talkie the, uh, because we just played a critical role. We were very, very lucky. None of our staff, ourselves, no one in the home was injured. We had uh, a contingent of Nepali police there. None of them were injured either. But, and the house stood. There was some minor damage inside, but it, it survived. But if you can imagine, we lived on an acre and a half compound and with a large wall. We uh, saw the wall had come down and I was able to make contact with the embassy through a, at the Marine Post One. I was also able uh, by walkie talkie to reach my deputy, the deputy chief of mission, John Carwile, who lived closer to the embassy and he and his family fortunately hadn't been hurt. And John was walking up to the embassy to see what he could do there. He reached me about five minutes later, 10 minutes later, and said he'd arrived. The roads were pretty much passable. The embassy had survived without any damage. We were very lucky. The embassy was a fairly new structure. It had been built less than five years before to the highest seismic standards. So it was designed to with, with, uh, withstand an earthquake. And thank God it, uh, it did well. I think the only damage to the entire building was we had a portion about the size of a coaster fall off the facade. John suggested, uh, said the roads were clear. I immediately drove up with uh, my bodyguard and my driver. We dispatched half the guards at the house to check on their families. My wife stayed, at, stayed out in the garden at the house. And we started going into our whole emergency procedures. First and foremost, you know, every embassy everywhere around the world, our primary and our first uh, goal is the protection of U.S. citizens. So we wanted to see, one, how our staff had fared, and two, how were citizens, tourists, and other Americans in the area. We also got in touch with the State Department using a uh, Iridium phone to let them know the earthquake had happened. Power, the phones was, uh, the municipal phone system was gone, cell phones were gone. Power, 
but normal electricity was gone. We were able to have generator at the house and certainly power at the, at the uh, chancery. When we got there, we looked and saw around that it was doing, but we were supporting, our embassy was medium sized, but we had about a hundred families living around the city, all in their own houses, homes, where they were reliant on the embassy to provide water and provide fuel for generators given the uh, situation in Nepal in normal times. We started our radio check and were able to get full accountability of all staff and their family probably within a couple hours. But even before that, sort of minute 45, once we, we didn't know how people's homes and stuff were damaged, I made the decision as ambassador that I was gonna move the entire mission and their families into the embassy to stay safe because the building was a uh, seismically, I don't wanna say secure, but probably the safest building in Nepal at that time for that. And we had power because we had our own generators. We had more than a month's supply of fuel. We generated, we had our own wells where we had potable water. So I could keep everyone safe there because I didn't know how difficult it would be to support them outside. Interestingly, which got a lot of press and uh, positive publicity. So we let everybody bring their pets. So uh, we had a chancery that went from being sort of a pristine State Department office building to a site where like the, those of you who are a certain age will remember the Woodstock Rock Festival very quickly. We had people staying everywhere. Because the embassy was well prepared and had been for many years, everyone, in every home and every person had what we had a go bag, which contained a sleeping bag and basic toiletries and everything else. So everybody was ready to come in and could get to the embassy very quickly with this. We also were all trained and to keep all our valuables, passports and everything else together. So we were able to move the staff in very quickly. Miraculously, none of our staff was injured. And we think the reason for this is, is when we would rent houses in Kathmandu, we would have them upgraded to be made as safe as reasonably possible than a normal rented house. So we do upgrades and this was something the landlord would have to do before we actually rent the house. The end result of this is we didn't have anybody seriously injured or hurt or killed. Other embassies sadly in the Valley lost personnel when housing structures stuff fell down on them. So by about the second hour, we had the entire mission and their staff, American staff in the chancery. We also put the word out that American citizens were welcome anybody who happened to be in town. They started trickling in. The mission has a second compound in, the Kath in Kathmandu where our uh, maintenance facilities were downtown. And that's where the, what happens um, in every natural disaster is you have a lot of things that are happenstance, but we had just had a large embassy sale the day before. So the tents for that were set up, which are basically like large circus tents we're still standing. So we're able to house a lot of people there. So we had a combination of US tourists, um, other friendly nations or anybody who needed help could be there and we were able to take them there. While all this is going on, I'm in constant touch with the State Department, the Operations Center, letting them know what we're doing. We're also trying to account for our local staff, our Nepali staff. This was a lot harder because they were more dispersed. We had a system in place where we could contact them but Nepal, like many uh, countries, it's a place where people live in the city, but their families are still out in the countryside. So immediately on the earthquake, many of them, some of them went out to see how they're doing because there was a lot more damage outside. It took us about two days to get full accountability of our local staff. Um, we also, because the State Department is well prepared in these things, about hour four or five, we had declared it a major natural disaster and teams were dispatched from the US, both from the Washington area, the Fairfax County Fire Department and from the Los Angeles area. Each of them are under contract to, uh, to the State Department to respond to natural disasters. And they have to mobilize, I think, in a given number of hours. And they were quickly on the way by a US Air Force plane on their way to Nepal. With them was a really critical group to our response called the Disaster Assistance uh, Response Teams from USAID, the DART teams. And simultaneously, concurrently, we were in touch with PACOM, the military command in the Pacific, 
particularly with the Marines in Okinawa, because they had been drilling with the Nepalese army, the Nepali army for years, that that rescue response would start as well. So they ramped up. And we kept going into gear. By this time, it's probably hour two, hour three. We suddenly had a knock on the embassy gate where we had a team of US Army Special Forces who had been up doing high altitude training in the Everest area, had just arrived back in Kathmandu, wanted to let, let us know they were safe, but how could they help? They came in, spoke to me. I dispatched them to go down and help any the poly official in uniform doing rescue work, not to put themselves in danger, but to assist given their extraordinary skill set. And I'm proud to say that the first uh, Nepalese citizen rescued by a joint team with a, with a foreigner on board was one of our special forces team helping out, the, I think the Nepali fire department got them out. They stayed with us for about another two weeks doing all sorts of things, going out and helping with the rescues. The uh, fire department teams arrived, I think, about 48 hours later. It's a long way from uh, Kathmandu out there. And they're, they're an amazing uh, tool because they are totally self-contained, have all sorts of expertise, medical expertise, seismic expertise. They know how to look at condemned buildings. They know how to check and have the equipment to see if people might still be inside. And as soon as they came, they, we linked them up with um, their Nepali counterparts and they went to work doing rescue work. Our military teams arrived about a day after that and we started the rescues all around the country, which was a much larger effort. Um, I, don't, I can't put it on the screen now, but what, what we had there was they arrived with Ospreys, these incredible aircraft that are, look like planes, can operate like a helicopter. And I have to say, as an American ambassador, to look over the mountains at the Kathmandu Valley and see the Ospreys coming in formation to land at the airport was a very big relief because I knew there was very little that we weren't able to assist. And then I think the other thing to keep there is we had made sure our staff was safe. We had made sure our locally, our Nepali staff were safe. And we immediately, probably within the first hour, I was in touch with the, uh, finally got a call through to the acting prime minister, the Nepali prime minister was out of the country to see what do you need and how can we help? And started working with them, putting together their list of needs. I think one of the key things to remember here is that we were in an assist mode. We were not leading this effort. We were there to coordinate and help our Nepali friends. But this was all done under the government of Nepal's leadership. And a lot of the international rescue efforts were done under the uh, leadership of the Nepalese army, the Nepali army, where we had had a long and standing positive relationship and been drilled with them. And it was very, very critical that this came about. And we put all these systems in place. They coordinated. I think at one point, the Nepal, Nepal army had probably 20 different nations in country helping and assist with this rescue operation doing the coordination and we were part of that. But where we went, who we rescued, how the guidance was done, was done with under their leadership and coordination. And I have to say uh, our response team was just incredible uh, on the military side. Sadly, about uh, I think 10 days into the rescue effort, we lost a uh, US helicopter. We had eight Marines killed in a terrible air tragedy we discovered later, along with a number of Nepalese citizens on board who were being rescued by them. It's just this sad crash in the mountains due to the, the weather and everything situation. But we coordinated many times. We coordinated closely with the government of India. We did a lot of joint operations. And what we found was, again, a happenstance thing. We had always prepared for a disaster that the airport in Kathmandu might not be usable that the runway would be down. And it was just luck, it wasn't damaged. So we were able to continue to bring rescue planes in. That was why the Ospreys came because had we not been able to use the runway, we would have had an incredible tough mission carrying stuff in. But we set up a, a lot of rescue work delivering supplies from USAID. And this effort seems, and what happens in all disasters like this is you very quickly change from rescue after the first let's say three to seven days to uh, 
restoration and relief and how are you gonna do? And we did that as well, getting the supplies to people that did it. It was a whole of government effort. Our secretary, uh, Kerry got on, he made a commitment. Um, at one later in the rescue, we actually facilitated conversations between President Obama and the Kampali prime minister about what the United States would do. But it, it took our entire government being in and, and with the, the embassy as a coordination point and how we would get things done. Ultimately, I think we pledged and got about $120 million towards this effort doing a wide variety of things. But the key here to remember is all these things is it doesn't just happen. This had been years of preparation. This was my third time in Nepal and I think we had started preparing for an earthquake during my second tour in the mid nineties where we uh, actually put these earthquake kits together for each home that we rented. We had a funny thing happen and my wife was about second week of the earthquake we were distributing the stuff in our that was in our earthquake kit at home because we didn't need it. We wanted to go out to the citizens in the neighborhood. And what did we find but the earthquake kit that we put together in 1994 was still there ready to go. Um, since that time, the embassy had just drilled and practiced and got that much better. And I was lucky to uh, inherit the work of many of my predecessors in drilling for that. Again, a happenstance thing, we had had a uh, staff meeting the Thursday before the earthquake. And I asked when the last time we had done a drill was, and I wasn't satisfied, it had been too many months. So I insisted one be done that day. People weren't happy because it was a Friday. So I said, oh, well, let's take the equipment out and test it. Let's put the tents up. Well, as luck would have it, they were still up. The equipment all ran and we used it all that Sunday. It was just one of those things. But again, the lesson, the leadership lesson for me is prepare, prepare, prepare. You cannot do that enough. The other thing that's critical in these situations and uh, very, very important is all the relationships you build up before the natural disaster happens. I, we had, uh, we were blessed with decades of very positive bilateral relationships between various governments in Nepal and the United States but the personal relationships. Uh, I had worked with the gentleman who was the chief of the army since he was a young lieutenant and I was a vice consul and we knew each other very well. So during this thing, we could ask each other for anything and get it done. And that's very, very critical. But these relationships, you can't establish them once you need them. These have to be well-established and used before. Communications are also the key. We coordinated everything. We had uh, our DART teams were very good at this. They're used to doing this. The military was very good at this. And my public affairs section did a very, very good job. And we worked with the government in Nepal to make sure none of our messages were crosswise because I think it's very, very important to do that. Um, it uh, was an exhilarating thing, but we very quickly discovered too, when you're responding to a crisis like this, you suddenly have to get into another part of leadership and that's making sure everybody doesn't overexert themselves. So what I suddenly found myself was uh, making sure everybody took time off. Again, a happenstance situation is our, uh, our regional psychiatrist who happened to come up for their quarterly visit was going through the visa line at the airport when the earthquake happened. Well, she was able to be there and help people work through the crisis. And she was able to advise me on making sure people got enough rest. And if people, you know, what you discover in any crisis is strong people reach a point where sometimes they, they need a break. And you know, we learned very quickly that if uh, I had a rule from day one, if anyone wanted to leave, they were authorized to leave and we would get them home because commercial flights continued to work throughout the whole time. Most of the staff didn't, they were incredibly dedicated. But the one thing you learn is this isn't a, a character statement, this isn't a a comment about anybody's qualities. It's just people work very hard. And at some point, sometimes it just gets to be too much, but we work through all those issues. Um, but you have to work, you have to take care of your staff. And the other thing I realized too, I knew this long before, that I was very, very diligent about always providing accurate information to the staff. 
on a regular basis. So they, they all basically knew what I knew about going on in the Delta earthquake. Um, as I said, we uh, very switched, quickly had switched from rescue to recovery. A few comments there in that one of the things that happens in every disaster is there's a very human tendency around the world to deliver stuff. Everybody wants to take a collection and send clothes, send this. And I've dealt with disasters in many countries, in Pakistan and uh, Nepal and Africa. What's needed is largely not stuff. What's needed is money. And the best way people can help, and this is in every disaster, is contribute to the charities you know and recognize and trust that do this kind of work, like the Red Cross or many of them, many, many great NGOs who do this sort of thing. The quicker that money gets to them, they know exactly what's needed. The quicker the money gets back in the economy of the place where the disaster is happening. This is all things that really, really make a difference. The other thing we had to coordinate is we had dozens, if not uh, hundreds of Americans who wanted to come volunteer with their specialties and take some coordination of what they could do. Um, USAID, played a remarkable role in all of this because they had plans in place. And one of the things is, you know, the initial focus as it should be is always on people. But what we discovered that as much of the damage and the structural of things, but again, a happenstance issue, this happened on a, um, on a weekend. So the schools weren't in session. So although many of the schools were damaged, the children weren't hurt. There was an extraordinary amount of livestock hurt or killed, which was devastating both from a nutrition and health point of view, but we spent a lot of focus of AID getting veterinary care done, bringing in replacement animals, things like that. It's a long-term process, but those are the types of things you have to do. We also worked with the Nepal police because sadly in every disaster, this is the time people who deal in Things like human trafficking, the bad guys come in and try to take advantage of pe desperate people. And to their credit, the Nepal police had set up patrols around the various internally displaced camps in Kathmandu. They were able to prevent rapes. They were able to prevent trafficking. And this was largely an effort because of the a successful effort because of the work we had spent working with the government of Nepal over the years in this and our relationship with the Nepal police. When I went to see the Inspector General of Police so the day three of the earthquake, he said, I just want to say, here's our plan. Here's how we're dealing with it. We're preventing the trafficking. We also were able to provide them with temporary structures since they lost many of the police stations around the country. We were provided, put in temporary buildings and stuff like that. Um, our efforts didn't stop. We uh, also got in the role of helping coordinate the international response because many international organizations were involved and because of the U.S. role and our longstanding role in Nepal. I was involved in that effort a lot. I accompanied many of the UN agency leaders who came to Nepal in their meetings with the government and did that. And then we also eventually transitioned to helping the government of Nepal as it sought financial assistance how to deal with the earthquake in the years and months after. We worked with them closely on that. Um, it, was, uh, it was one of the, I have to uh, being able to be there and make a difference, I have to say, was one of the highlights of my career. We really did make a difference and we made a difference in people's lives. It was tragic that we lost so many of our military colleagues, but I was blessed to have an extraordinary staff, um, my deputy, John Carwell, um, we had people specifically uh, who had a sole role was disaster preparedness. We had an embassy earthquake coordinator, even before the earthquake, uh, a family member named Susan Goldman, who made sure we were well stocked with all these things we used. And these efforts really, really made a difference. The other thing I had was incredible support from the State Department. We uh, were in constant touch with them. We were providing sit reps as soon as we got our comms up every, initially every six hours, then every day. And the Undersecretary for Management, Pat Kennedy and I were personally in touch every day. I was in touch with uh, then Deputy Secretary Blinken, letting them know what we were doing and that, that we were doing our best to get things done. It was, uh, an, it was an extraordinary effort, but I have to say, I think uh, looking back, 
was representative of something I call American goodness. We have the tools and the capabilities to do these things and we do them well, both on the civilian side and on the military side. When our military came in, it wasn't just rescue work. They were welping, helping coordinate the operations at the airport. They were helping uh, improve the airport's ability to quickly unload aircraft. At one point, we actually helped patch the runway, which was becoming damaged from so many heavy airplanes landing. And of course, there's like everything, you know, when you get that many countries involved, diplomacy comes into it too. The great game of world powers was also at play. As I said, we set, a, a, I think, a new standard for our cooperation working with the government of India on this response. We had less luck working with the government of China on this. They didn't want us there doing what we did, but our relationships were well established and we were going to do them anyway, and we did. So I'll stop there and uh, catch my breath. Absolutely. So. Uh, I believe you touched upon just about all the questions that I had, I had prepared. And I think if anything, I would just ask if you don't mind summarizing what were the um, lessons learned from your response to the earthquake? I think I, I've touched on most of them, but I think, again, you cannot prepare enough. Um, you have to drill. You know, everybody laughs and it's just, nobody likes going out in the rain for a fire drill anywhere in the world but you have to drill, drill, drill. One of the things that made us successful is everybody knew what their role was. Everybody knew what they had to do. One of the, my roles and my deputy's roles was to keep everybody in their lane. The other thing as an ambassador, one of the key lessons was this was a disaster response that had much of our government involved. But as the ambassador, I lead the country team, the interagency effort. They're all under your authority. You have to make sure that everybody plays according to the plan. And that's what we did. The other thing is you have to spend a lot of time caring and feeding for your people. I mean, not just the nutritional part, but making sure people are okay. We spent a lot of time doing that. And I have to say the staff spent a lot of time checking on my, me, checking on my deputy, where, how are we doing? But it was that kind of effort. Because if you don't do that, or people, you don't make sure everybody's getting their rest. That people uh, who've had enough are given the opportunity to get a break. That's when things start to fail. The other key was we did an extraordinary job, I think, of keeping Washington informed of what we were doing. They knew where we stood. They knew how many liters of diesel fuel we had, how much water, how much food. But it meant that they let us do our job and were there in a supportive role to do it. And that was very positive. The other thing I learned and um, is things like this, even if you're not hurt or injured in the actual event, they make a great, great impact on you. And the one who best explained this to me was our new deputy secretary, uh, Wendy Sherman, who was, had been in, in New Zealand during the earthquake. I hope she doesn't mind telling the story, but she reached out to us by video conference and explained that Late at night, we had about 100 of the embassy staff in the, the uh, auditorium to meet with her and took our questions, but she explained how everybody there had, life would be different having lived through this experience and it takes a toll on you and you have to bring to that. And that's very, very true. It was very good advice. And I have to say after her video conference, everybody left one feeling better for understanding what they were going through, but two, a lot, very appreciative of that and just recognize the work we were doing. So I think that's another lesson there. Um, I can't say enough about my military colleagues, you know, losing the Marines in this effort was just a terrible, terrible tragedy. But, you know, this is the United States and when something happens, we're there to respond. And as an American ambassador, one of the great joys is the world still looks to us as the great world's greatest hope and when bad things happen, they look, where are we? And they know when we get there, things are going to get better. And that was certainly the case. And we were just a piece of it, but we made a difference. And that's, that's a great place to be. Absolutely. I was wondering if we could transition to another question where um, what were the long-term or future plans that you helped to create um, post the earthquake or while even um, you had touched upon a number of them? going into the earthquake, but what were some of the ones that came out of the earthquake? Well, I think the key is to continue what was done before. 
um, you have to do that. And as an embassy, one of the things we quickly did was to restock everything we had. It sounds silly, but even as we were doing the you know, rescue efforts, I was we were in touch with making sure that should something happen again, we would be prepared. You can't stop on the training. Um, I think one of the lessons I took away, and this started long before I got there, but I, when I got there, I kept it going, maybe increased it a little bit, was we had taken advantage of all the tools in our toolbox in terms of getting our staff trained. Our military colleagues in PACOM were incredibly generous in sending out medical professionals to provide advanced um, first aid training to the entire mission, not just the Americans, but our local staff. All of that stuff paid off. We had supplies in place. We had food in place. Everything was there and you just can't do it enough. And I think the takeaway was you can't assume when you, as an ambassador, you go anywhere that these things are in place. Now, not everybody's in an earthquake area, but disasters happen everywhere. You never know what it can be. And you have to make sure that you're comfortable when you know what tools are there and what you can do. And the other thing is that it's just a personal lesson is when a crisis like that comes as the leader at a post, you own it. And uh, I've, I've addressed the ambassadorial seminar many times since this the last five years, when we really train new ambassadors. I've addressed our security officers. I think some of our deputy chief of mission training too is just explaining these lessons of what you have to do and be prepared to do it. In terms of with the host government, we continue to work with them as we always have on disaster preparedness, making sure they have things in place to the extent they can. And that the systems, they have government systems in place to do it. So I was wondering, just based off of your explanation of everything going on, especially when the international factors started to come in, if you could elaborate just on some of those experiences dealing with uh, India as they started to come in. And you said it said that, um, you had a great experience with the Nepalese government and cooperation there yes. was very strong. Yeah, well, as I said, this was, I was, I think, extraordinarily lucky in that this was my third tour in Nepal. So I was a known quantity that many of the people in government had been working with for 20 years. Many of them, when they, uh, the democracy was first restored in the 90s, I had worked with them there. So they knew me and there was a level of trust there. So. And they knew if you know, I said we could do something, we would do it. I said that we couldn't do something, they knew not to question it. I was not, you know, people who know me know I'm not a shrinking violet. And if I thought they should be doing something, I certainly let them know. But sometimes you have to engage in stuff. At one point, for example, there was concern that our planes were too heavy and they didn't want to, they want to stop them coming into the airport. So, that took a little bit of political negotiation with a lot of different people, but that got turned off very quickly and the planes continued to land. Um, we, uh, the coordination with other countries, I think was really important. We, we had a very friendly and cooperative diplomatic community in Kathmandu before the earthquake, but we all knew each other, the ambassadors, and we trusted each other and understood each other's role. That's not to say that you know, we all understand that different countries' national interests. When it came to this, we all knew what to do and made sure we were all working together and that responses were coordinated. Um, but it doesn't just happen. As I said, you can't count on the relationship when you need it. You have to establish this stuff well before. And I think as an American ambassador, it behooves you to maintain those relationships and go out of your way to do it. You know, I think there's a tendency, oh, we're in the United States. Well, no. All of these people, all of my diplomatic partners were important to the success of the effort. And, I won't, and because we knew each other and trust each other, we were able to get a lot done. So I think that just about wraps up our interview here. So once again, thank you very much, Ambassador Bodhi, for taking the time out of your day to talk to us about the uh, Nepal and the earthquake. It was very informative. Um, if you haven't already, please follow us on YouTube and follow the Academy's social media pages for more interviews to come. So thank you once again, Ambassador Bodie. My pleasure. Thank you, Jonah.